Her, why don't uh, we reconvene? This uh, subcommittee will, hearing will be will reconvene at this point in time. I understand that Mr. Cohen had to leave, but um, Mr. Ammerman, you uh, mentioned having met with the president. Um, I believe you said in April of this year. And uh, are you familiar with? Uh, well, what did he say to you about establishing a group to overlook to investigate Pan Am 103? Uh, it's sort of interesting. Uh, we sensitized the president. Uh, in a 20-minute meeting that lasted for 70 minutes in four areas. Uh, we talked about the uh, complete incompetence of the State Department in the handling of the relatives of the victims of Pan Am Flight 103. Uh, we implored him that there had to be a major change in airport and airline security since there was none. And then we gently reminded him that he was the architect of the counterterrorism policy, of which, uh, as of October of 1988, it seemed that only 21 out of the 42 points had been implemented. We strongly encouraged him, since he was now president and had the authority as the leader of the free world, that he could now implement the own pol his own policy that he was an architect of. And that in that was this central analysis center that would eliminate uh, this conflict of interest and this bureaucratic human weakness of power and greed. And uh, we strongly urged him uh, to do that. Uh, his indications was he was dismayed by the, the actions of the State Department in regard to handling of the victims' relatives. And since then, we've opened up dialogue with the State Department. Uh, Secretary of Transportation Skinner was there. Uh, the Transportation Department has become our contact to the executive branch. And we've had some dialogue with the Transportation Department. We walked out of the meeting really believing that the President understood the issues and the concerns. But I think Mrs. Boxer in the mo this morning put it eloquently that all we're hearing is a lot of verbiage, a lot of words. We're not seeing any action. And uh, the president has got to move with his advisors. Scowcroft was there, uh, Chief of Staff uh, Sununu, and Fitzwater. And it's now coming on October 3rd. And when I met with Secretary of State Baker in April, I said to the Secretary then that right now we're working with you, we're trying to be proactive, we're trying to affect change. But believe me, December 21st we're going to have a memorial service, first year anniversary, which is most likely going to be the second toughest day that we'll all go through. And on that day I will have a statement to the press nationwide and worldwide regarding what we feel that our respective governments and agencies have done regarding relative to Pan Am Flight 103, and there better darn well be some positive changes. So right now, we're watching, we're frustrated, but we're not giving up. And it seems that we say wherever we go, and I, I know you will appreciate this, Madam Chairman, is the factor we're not going away. I affectionately now say that the government agencies, the executive branch, thinks that the victims of Pan Am Flight 103 is a boil on their butt, and they've been trying to lance it for nine months and they can't even do that properly. And the only way to successfully do that is to, to deal with it truthfully and with forthrightness. And then we will be successful for all Americans. Pleased at the, were you pleased that the President announced that he was going to create a commission to investigate Pan Am 103? We were satisfied. Uh, pleased uh, it might be too strong a term. Uh, the concern that we have is there's no subpoena power. The concern is that this was uh, written in, into order on August 4th, and he still hasn't picked the committee. And we're almost eight weeks later, and he's, all he had to do was pick three private citizens. And uh, we hope that it, in due course uh, that he will do that. I know that some of the people from the Senate and the representatives uh, has been chosen, and we're very pleased so far with the people that have been, uh, from what we understand, have been named. It's a step in the right direction as long as the issues are dealt with and followed. One other thing, Madam Chairman, uh, I think it was Mr. Nielsen uh, that asked the question about, you know, is it possible to have an effective security management system in place? Uh, I am not an expert, but I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to put an organizational chart in place where there is some accountability and where you can have an effective system that can deal with airport and airline security. Mr. Vincent? Madam Chairwoman, if I might. 
impose on the subcommittee for a couple of moments to speak to a few points that were made or not made this morning on the panel by the FAA. One of the things being training. There is currently no required amount of training required by the FAA, that is the U.S. government, for security screening personnel, people who apply the profiles, the ground, the ground security coordinator and the in-flight security coordinator are the only persons and the cabin crews that have minimum amounts of training required. The majority of the security system in place and required by the U.S. Civil Aviation Security System is zero. It's true that the subject matter and certain areas are decreed that have to be covered, but there's no minimum number of hours. This is why you wind up with minimum wage people and an extremely high turnover of people doing these functions. Now, after I left the FAA, I guess I had a chance to think this over. And the one, the one way that I know of, of now substantially increasing the competence of the system as it concerns application, is for the FAA to decree a minimum number of hours for the security screeners and so on. This would have the benefit not only of raising the level of competence, but it also would put a penalty on the airlines for allowing a high rate of turnover. In other words, it makes the employee more valuable to the airline, therefore they ought to be willing to pay more money to keep the employee. That is, if they have to invest this much, this amount of training in the individual. That is one big deficiency in the U.S. system that ought to be remedied. <clears throat> Someone else asked a question about the bond declaration and how many times it had been exercised. The bond declaration is a result of a suggestion by a Japanese prime minister back in 1978, as I recall, in one of the Summit 7 meetings. And it says in one paragraph, or at least until 1986 when it was substantially added to, that if an offending country doesn't do certain things, that the seven summit nations, the economic nations, will impose certain sanctions, and those, in essence, are economic sanctions. It has been done one time, and that was in the case of Ariana in 1983 or 84, because of the Afghan, Afghan government's handling of a hijacking that went in there in about 81 or 82. We beat up on Ariana, a small airline that no one had any economic ties to, to speak of, in Afghanistan. But we could not impose anything against countries like Libya, Algeria, Syria, and so on, who had repeated problems where they would be in violation of the Bonn Declaration. Because too many people, Iran was included in that, had too much to lose economically. So the Bonn Declaration has not worked up to this point. <clears throat> And this seems a bit disjointed. This is from a couple of notes that I've made. I would also feel more comfortable, Madam Chairwoman, about airlines uh, commitment to good security if I heard their representatives when they appear before this subcommittee actually cite the right governing regulation that concerns security. I heard, it, I heard repeated references this morning to FAR Part 107, which covers security for U.S. airports. Part 108 is the regulation that covers airlines. Those airline representatives that appear before this committee at least ought to know that. I heard also the director of security for the FAA say that the U.S. 
is the preeminent U.S. security system is the preeminent one in the world. That just simply is not so. The Israeli system is the preeminent one in the world. If you want to hold the U.S. system up as being preeminent, then why do we have Pan American 103 on December 21st, 1988, TWA 840 on April 2nd, 1988, 86, Pan Am, August 11th, 1982, Pan Am, August 25th, 1982, and so on. Granted, that's going back several years, but we have seen nothing in the recent years that would say that the U.S. security system is the preeminent one in the world. Certainly not the one to hold up as a model on which to go by. By the same token, we hear the acknowledgement that El Al, the El Al system, is the best in the world. And if my logic is correct, with all of these failures of the U.S. system, then why haven't we adopt, adopted the El Al system? With that, Madam Chairwoman, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to those several points. I certainly thank uh, you, Mr. Ammerman and Mr. Uh, Cohen, for uh, testifying before us today. Your testimony and certainly the work that you have done in the past uh, nine months uh, has heightened the awareness of the need for better airport security both in our nation and outside our continental limits. Uh, I thank you for coming for your very uh, candid uh, testimony uh, because we certainly understand how you feel and we know the fine job that you have done in trying to get at and make some changes so that others won't have to live through the situation through which you are living today. Let me say, too, that I apologize for being gone so long last time. However, when I left here, I was under the impression we had one vote. It ended up that we had two 15-minute votes, which took more than 30 minutes, even though it shouldn't, and a five-minute vote. Now we have one more vote. And for that reason, we are grateful that the, the uh, the next panel has agreed to come before us tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock and be the first ones up, and I want to thank them, too. With that, I thank all of our witnesses today and adjourn this hearing until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you. This hearing of the Government Activities and Transportation will reconvene at this time. This panel consists of Mr. Billy Vincent, who is a former FAA Director of Security, Mr. Burke Emmerman, who's the president of the Families of Victims of Pan Am 103. Mr. Daniel Cohen, who is also representing a group called Survivors of Pan Am 103. Mr. Vincent, why don't we begin with you? Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. And will you, uh, will all of you, well, Mr. Vincent, will you raise your stand, please? Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Do. Thank you. Now you may begin, Mr. Vincent. Thank Let you. Let me restate for uh, for all the, who might not have been here earlier, as a panelist, and I'm sure you all were, the House operates under a five-minute rule. You'll be, we will be given five minutes to um, summarize your testimony with the knowledge that your entire testimony will be made a part of the record. You may now begin. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and members of the subcommittee. Sitting here this uh, morning listening to the testimony, I'm somewhat frustrated perplexed and distressed with some of the things I hear said. I certainly don't agree with many of them and will take the opportunity that this presents to give my differences uh, over the next several minutes. I appear before the committee today with the hope that these hearings will result in the building of a civil aviation security system that will prevent another Pan Am 103 tragedy. The recent unsettling news about the loss of the French UTA DC-10 with 171 people adds impetus to the task of correcting the deficiencies in the U.S. civil aviation security system. Unfortunately, I am a realist after having spent over 30 years working for the U.S. government. My expectations about what this government is inclined to do are somewhat less than I what I believe is necessary. First, let me say the obvious. The current U.S. civil aviation security system is seriously deficient 
It did not prevent the Pan Am 103 tragedy from happening, and more important, what has been done since December 21, 1988, will not prevent another similar tragedy. My full statement for the record will illustrate my position and the reasons why I believe this to be true, and that statement is now available. My remarks will focus primarily on the international arena because that is where the greatest threat to civil aviation exists. First, U.S. civil aviation security is a shared responsibility between the civil aviation industry and the U.S. government, with the passengers and the U.S. taxpayers paying for the system. A simple way to state the philosophy under which the civil aviation security system operates is that the FAA makes the rules and requirements and the U.S. air carriers and airport operators are responsible for application of these rules and requirements. Outside the United States, these requirements are slightly different with the host country providing or having the responsibility to provide the security system. The U.S. air carriers are required by the FAA to make, take specific measures to compensate for any deficiencies on, part, on the part of the host country. An effective security system has to contain certain essential elements. These elements must work in harmony to produce the protection desired. An overabundance of security, provided it contains the essential elements and these elements are effectively applied, should provide a satisfactory countermeasure to any given threat level. An overabundance of security, if it does not address the threat, will not provide the security protection required to counter a specific threat level. In addition, an underabundance of security, or one that contains all of the essential elements, but is ineffectively executed, will not provide any positive level of security for any given threat level. Most of my comments will be based in relation to a threat level. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, the hijinth hijacking threat to civil aviation worldwide increased to such proportions that the U.S. developed and implemented a security system to prevent or deter hijacking of U.S. airlines. It was a U.S. government mandated system. The nature of the threat to U.S. civil aviation changed from one of hijacking to a sophisticated sabotage threat in the early to mid 1980s. The precursor to this threat change were the two Pan Am bombs in August 1982, which I will describe in a moment. In the same time period, the incidence of hijacking of U.S. airlines dramatically decreased. Unfortunately, unlike the action taken in the early 1970s to protect against hijackings, the U.S. government has not yet required the development and implementation of a comprehensive civil aviation security system to protect against sophisticated bombs. <clears throat> the terrorist only has to be lucky once to achieve his or her purpose, that is, the destruction of an airliner in flight. Like the IRA terrorists set after the Brighton, England bombing that almost killed Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, we only have to get lucky once. She has to be lucky every time. We in the U.S. have to stop relying on luck and build a system that protects U.S. civil aviation against sophisticated bombs. In my statement for the record, I have described in words and pictures the nature of the threat against U.S. civil aviation. It is necessary that the types of sabotage devices be known, their ease of concealment, difficulty of detection, and their destructive potential be described. In each of these categories, the level 
of sophistication of the threat to civil aviation dramatically increased beginning in the early 1980s. Madam Chairwoman and members of this subcommittee, I am prepared to illustrate the sophistication of these bombs and ask, answer your questions at your convenience. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in these hearings. As part of your time, I understand. I understand you have some illustrations you wanted to make for us? Yes, I would like to take a few minutes and brief the committee on... Syntax explosives, one eighth of an inch thick, approximately, and approximately 10 inches long. Now, all of these that I'm going to show you are representations of the sophisticated devices. They are not the specific exact details. This bomb contained an electronic timer, but before the timer and the circuitry was an, a barometric sensor. This barometric sensor would not activate until the flight was above a certain altitude. Once that airplane got above a certain altitude, it would start ticking time off against the timer. And then if the time had not expired by the time the airplane descended back below the preset altitude on the barometric sensor, the bomb would go inactive. When the flight took off again, and once again flew above a certain altitude, the device became active again, and that sequence would repeat itself until the time that had been programmed in the E-cell timer would expire. It was powered by two AAA batteries. I could be carrying two of them right now. They're that easy to conceal in, inside the coat pocket. The second illustration is a uh, suitcase bomb. The sides, both sides, around the, the uh, sides, the top and the bottom, was coated with Simtex explosives, approximately one eight inch thick again. The same circuitry that I just described for the other device was secreted usually on the bottom of the suitcase down next to the posts of the device so that this would aid in <coughs> confusing the, uh, the device to x-ray examination. This particular one has shown up twice. The Wall Street Journal carried an article on June 29, 1984 about <coughs> this bomb being transported by a British, a British national from Athens to Tel Aviv, Ben Gurion, back to London, back to Athens. It malfunctioned, did not explode. The lady did not know she was carrying a bomb. This was carried by a Duke. The previous device I described well, has never been carried by a Duke. It is something that an individual has to know that they're carrying to activate. The second occasion for this to show up was in February 1986 when the Israelis picked up one of these in their security system. 
They missed the first, they caught the second. The third illustration is of the uh, representation of the device that Ms. Ann Murphy tried to carry on an LL flight on August, or April 17, 1986 through Heathrow. She evaded Heathrow security. She did not know she was carrying a functioning bomb. And she was detected once she came up against the LL security system as she was getting ready to board, her, board the airplane. And I'll explain the details of some of that later and tomorrow in executive session if you choose. The device consisted of two or three sheets of plastic explosives secreted below a false bottom of her carry-on bag, which her boyfriend had given her, and a calculator lying on top of that with the calculator serving as the timer, the power source, and the detonator, the blasting cap, was all contained within that. All very innocuous and did not appear as a bomb. The fourth example representation is the device that was put on the Korean Air flight in uh, late 1987 by the two North Korean agents. It was a fully functioning radio where one of the batteries had been wired to a blasting cap which was in the C4 plastic explosives about two-thirds of a pound. The other three batteries still powered the radio. The radio functioned fully. Then there was an additional amount of explosives in a whiskey bottle, liquid explosives that was set next to the device. This device did not have a barometric sensor. This was left in the overhead bin above seat 7C and 7B and 7C on the Korean Air 707 that was lost over the Andaman Sea. The last is a representation of the Toshiba Bomb Beat 453 ratio found in the PFLP GC safe house raid by the West German BKA on August, or October 26, 1988. It had within it approximately 11 ounces of Simtex explosives wrapped in a Tobler uh, candy bar wrapper, blasting cap in that, and it had the same circuitry essentially as those first two bombs I described. The barometric sensor, the electronic timer, an internal power source independent of the batteries of the radio. Now this gets very important when we get into procedures tomorrow or you get into the procedures tomorrow in an executive session on what type of examinations are necessary in order to be able to detect this type of bomb. It is not a very simple thing to do. Madam Chairwoman and members of the subcommittee, that's my presentation on types of devices. Thank you very much, Mr. Vincent. Our next witness will be Mr. Bert Ammerman, who's the president of a, the group called Family of Victims Pan Am 103. Mr. Ammerman. Thank you, <coughs> Madam Chairwoman. This morning, I left at 7 o'clock in the morning. We have about 14 members from our group here. We paid our own way. We've all lost loved ones. So I know. May I? I don't want to interrupt you, but may I ask him to stand because I want to give them their proper recognition. Won't you stand, please? Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> we have been in Washington, D.C. for the last nine months, monitoring and speaking and testifying at hearings. I know there's a five-minute limit, and I know the time constraints. However, Madam Chairman, I wish that you could yield, as you say in your terminology, maybe another two or three minutes so I can get through with what I have to say, because I think it'll be very worthwhile as you've listened this morning, and now you'll listen to the truth. No objection. Hearing no objection, you may proceed. In August, a delegation from our organization went to the United Kingdom for five days. 
and had 20 me uh, me uh, meetings with government officials both in the United Kingdom and Scotland. It is amazing that ordinary citizens, through the eyes of the media, have to bring the world back to where this tragedy has taken place. And we will be going to Frankfurt, Germany, November 8th, 9th, and 10th to meet with the West German government officials to find out when they're going to begin the process since it all started there. But interestingly enough, we met with the managing director, Alan Proctor, of Heathrow Airport in a two-hour meeting. And the FAA sent Benjamin Demps from Brussels to also be at that meeting. It was one of the worst meetings that we ever partook in during this whole nine-month chaotic excursion. Halfway through the meeting, one of our members, Rick Hartunian, asked Mr. Proctor, what lessons did you learn from Pan Am Flight 103? And I will never forget his answer. And this is it. Lessons? Lessons? There were no lessons from Flight 103. It was an incident, and we made changes, but no lessons. And those are the individuals that are responsible for security at Heathrow Airport, the British Aviation Authority. Mr. Ford testified this morning and a few other people, hoping that we don't ever have to go through another Pan Am Flight 103. Obviously, I guess a plane being blown out over the air in Africa is not Pan Am Flight 103. It was an instant replay. Same thing, terrorists, 171 innocent people blown out of the air because of airport and airline security. Our Connecticut families just this weekend when we had an organizational meeting has put together a new button. And it really symbolizes this whole hearing. Because I listened to Mr. Cox and I've listened to politicians for almost nine months. And it says Pan Am Flight 103, December 21st, 1988. Terrorism and apathy, a deadly combination. And that's all I heard this morning. Apathy, double talk. I heard Mr. Cunningham from Pan Am state that since he's taken over, there's been a change in attitude. Well, from the information and for the record, I was at JFK in June of 1989, where I had to go to be told that my brother was on that plane. And I watched eight people that our organization have now called from non-alert, because it's very unfair to say that they're from alert management. It's non-alert management. And I watched six of them watch a door for two hours, of which no one came in or went out. And I watched two of them sneak cigarettes, trying to hide them from the supervisor. And they laughed for two hours. If that is the change in attitude that Mr. Cunningham was referring to from Pan Am, I think we have something to be very concerned about. With that, Madam Chairman, I will go into the presentation that I have. In the nine months since the bombing, many disturbing revelations have been made known about the state of security at the time of the bombing. These revelations must be addressed and dealt with. The approach to airline and airport security is totally inadequate and must be completely reviewed and revised. The seemingly passive approach, which we witnessed this morning in testimony, by the U.S. government towards dealing with international terrorism is ineffective, inappropriate, and sends a frightening message to terrorists. We will express our concerns in this testimony. Due to the hesitancy of appropriate government agencies to be open and cooperative with family members over the last nine months, we have been forced to become knowledgeable in the areas of airline and airport security procedures and terrorism policy. We have found through our experience that you do not need to be an expert to understand that there are severe deficiencies prevalent in the current airline and airport security systems. The question is, are government leaders committed to this premise by action rather than verbiage? The air traveler who puts faith in the airline and government regulation of the security procedures of that airline is making a fatal mistake. There is essentially no protection of the air traveler on U.S. carriers. And instead, it seems that the almighty dollar is what is being protected. Airlines should be responsible for the safe operation of airplanes, while the ultimate security of the passengers must be the responsibility of government agencies. Airlines are in the business to make money. Governments are responsible for the protection of the public. Government must take an active role in structuring and maintaining security policy and procedures. We are living in an age where terrorism is a plague. In this case, we are specifically speaking of terrorism in the air. 
it is not going to go away because we want it to. The government must be ready to prevent acts of terrorism. This cannot be left up to the airlines. In dealing with Flight 103, it appears that the FAA and State Department chose not to deal with the possibilities of the bombing occurring even in light of various warnings. And now in the aftermath, these agencies seem more concerned with shifting accountability to others and covering up mishaps than dealing with the reality of the government's role and what led up to this bombing. Someone has got to take charge, and the finger of the American people points to the United States government. By the same token, foreign governments must be held accountable for security procedures in their countries. The FAA must attempt to regain the confidence of the traveler in its handling of the security. It will be extremely difficult to regain confidence in the agency with Raymond Salazar still holding the position of Director of Security. Mr. Salazar testified at Senator Lerton Wattenberg's hearing where we were present on March 14, 1989. And at this hearing, when questioned by Senator Lautenberg whether there were any other warnings beside the Helsinki warning, Mr. Salazar clearly stated that the Helsinki warning was the only warning relating to Pan Am Flight 103 received by the FAA. Shortly after this hearing, it was announced there were at least six other warnings which contained information that could be linked to the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. This morning, you heard him and other people say that the warnings didn't specifically go to Flight 103. The warning was a three-week warning on a Pan Am flight from Frankfurt to London to New York before the holidays. But that's not specific enough. We can't act yet. In a statement by the esteemed chairwoman of this committee, Curtis Collins, it was stated that these and other FAA bulletins were sometimes untimely, dangerously inadequate, and almost completely devoid of effective and specific instructions for countering possible threats. I think Mrs. Boxer asked a question this morning to Mr. Salazar about dealing with Pan Am. And if you listen to the answer, it summed it all up. They requested Pan Am to do something. They requested Pan Am to do something. It is very difficult to have confidence in an individual who was less than forthright in his testimony before a Senate subcommittee. Mr. Salazar must step down from his position in order that the FAA begin to regain credibility in the area of airport and airline security. Just 48 hours ago, a little over 100 of our members met in New Jersey. A resolution was stated, seconded, and by acclamation, calling for the immediate resignation of stepping down of Mr. Salazar as the director of the FAA. To further substantiate our belief that Mr. Salazar must step down, we, we, we cite a recent television program titled The Reporter, shown on Fox Television. Mr. Salazar was interviewed by reporter Steve Wilson regarding security operations at Frankfurt. When questioned, Mr. Salazar repeatedly stated that security in Frankfurt was in compliance. We've done what we're supposed to. And when asked if the director of security had personally followed up to ensure that this was true, he simply said no. We have four recommendations that we'd like to put forth in front of the committee to consider. And as an aside, I would love to know what's going on in that closed session tomorrow because it didn't seem too difficult for the terrorists to succeed. It would be more appropriate in closed session tomorrow that they have suggestions on how to improve it because it seems everyone knows how to break through it. The media is going to have television shows beginning tonight to show that. The FAA or an appropriate agency designated by the president must be given complete responsibility and authority over airline and airport security. This agency must be responsible for the security of the passenger while the airline should maintain responsibility for the safe operation of the plane. The agency must be responsible for the recruitment, training, and appropriate compensation of security personnel. The funding for this program could be shared by the government, airlines, and the traveling public. This approach would effectively eliminate the conflict of interest which currently exists, and you heard it all this morning in the testimony. I don't know how you people sit through this stuff. When it comes to protecting a precious human life, expense cannot be the primary issue. Placing responsibility of security procedures in the hands of airlines is a conflict of interest. Airlines are in the business to make money. Precious dollars are cut from vital security budgets to raise bottom line profits. Mr. Cunningham, in a response to you today, said he was satisfied with the budget. Mrs. Boxer says, when you want to raise that? He says, yeah, we'd like to have more money. Well, then I obviously can't be satisfied with the budget. No corporation should have absolute authority over decisions which reflect on the safety and security of human lives. Security personnel must be skilled professionals, not minimum wage, 
poorly compensated and poorly trained individuals. Leaving the security in the hands of Pan Am or any other airline was a major factor which contributed to the downing of Pan Am Flight 103. The second one is very important based on Mr. Cuck's uh, testimony this morning. And we stated this to Ms. President Bush on April 3rd when we met with him. There should be a central analysis center where all intelligence information is sent, analyzed, and disseminated to all appropriate agencies at the same time. There are conflicts, competition, and power struggles between agencies that cannot be eliminated. So let's pick one and let's hold them accountable. President Bush put this in his counterterrorism policy, which he stated to President Reagan when he was then vice president. There must be a commitment for the proper mix of technology with adequately trained personnel to ensure that prudent security measures are in place and in use. And finally, this is the most important. There must be a dual approach to international terrorism by our government. The political shell game that our politicians and the executive branch are using has got to end, not only here, but in the United Kingdom, West Germany, and France. The leaders of these countries have got to get their head out of the sand. The attack on December 21st, 1988, and the attack last week in Africa was not only a criminal act, but was a political action as well. Governments have hidden behind the facade of criminal activity so they do not have to deal with state-sponsored terrorist acts. The terrorists who committed this horrible act should be identified, prosecuted, and punished. But as the Lord Advocate of Scotland, who's in charge of prosecuting, told us in all probability, they will definitely identify these individuals, but most likely never bring them to justice. That's some state of affairs. However, the countries that harbor these criminals and endorse these acts must be dealt with politically. We must have economic, diplomatic, and military strategies in place to counter these cowardly acts and be willing to implement them. On De on last paragraph. On December 21st, 1988, we lost our loved ones in a horrific massacre. We realized that never again will we be able to talk, laugh, or cry with our loved ones. We want to prevent this senseless and preventable tragedy from occurring again to people like yourselves and your families or to the poor people of Chad. Therefore, we are calling upon you as our elected representatives to make certain that appropriate recommendations are made to move toward ensuring the safety of our airways. Madam Chairman, I also have a list of questions here that if I had an opportunity to address to Mr. Salazar, I would love to get on record today. If that is not possible in this closed session, I would hope that you could convey these questions to him. But the only question right now that I would like on the record that Mr. Salazar either answers you tomorrow or answers us today is, is Mr. Salazar or anyone else in the FAA willing to produce all the notes, documents, and memorandums in their files regarding Pan Am Flight 103? All that the FAA, State Department, and everyone else has talked about since March is what they're doing now. The obvious question is, listening to the testimony this morning, how did the bomb go undetected? This is a Freedom of Information Act. I know there's a process we can follow through, but Mr. Salazar should, should uh, show complete cooperation here by saying, yes, we can make that available. I have other questions, Madam Chairman. If I have time, I'd like to express them. Thank you for your leniency. Mr. Cohen. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I'm very grateful that you invited me to testify here today. I'm not an expert on airline security, but I think it's important for you all to hear from the victims' family members. Statistics like 270 people killed, particularly if they're nine months old, tend to become rather remote and abstract. I'm here to remind you that those were real people who were killed. And there are real people whose lives have been shattered beyond repair, who have been left behind. I recognize, Madam Chairman, I don't have to tell you this. You know what I'm talking about. And that's why I think it's very appropriate that you are chairing these significant hearings. My daughter, Theodora, Theo we called her, would have been 21 years old the 10th of this month. She was one of the many college students who was killed in the bombing of Pan Am 103. The average age of those killed in that catastrophe was 27. A lot of promising young lives were cut short on December 21st, 1988. The loss of a child is the most cruel blow that can ever befall anyone. It's made even harder when you realize that this loss was not inevitable. 
Pan Am 103 was an entirely preventable disaster if only the people who had been charged with protecting the security of the passengers on that plane had been doing their job. We wouldn't have to have these hearings today. This is also harder to handle if you suspect, and I think most of the families, uh, victims' family members suspect, that there were some privileged people who were warned off this flight, while others, like my daughter, were allowed to go innocently to their deaths. In the days immediately following the tragedy, my wife Susan and I were in sort of a daze. We didn't watch the news, we didn't read newspapers. We didn't really know what was happening. Then a few days after Christmas, I got a call from a reporter and he asked me about what my opinion was on a warning about a bomb on a Pan Am flight from Frankfurt to London to New York um, that was, was supposed to be bombed sometime in the weeks before Christmas. And this warning had been posted in the embassy in Moscow. Now, I tend to be fairly cynical about the government, but not that cynical. Surely, if there had been that kind of a warning, something would have been done. The passengers would have been notified. I called the State Department. A special number had been given to me by my congressman, Benjamin Gilman. It connected me directly with someone who was handling the matter of Pan Am 103. I talked to a woman. I don't recall her name now. And I asked her about this warning. And she said, yes, there had been such a warning. And I was horrified. And she became rather... Huffy, I think, and she said, do you know that three State Department employees were also on that plane and they were killed? And I said to her, did they know about the warning? And she admitted, yes, they did. I said, then they had a choice, didn't they? They knew whether they had a choice whether to take the risk or not. My daughter had no such choice, and I hung up. That was the first and last time I have called the State Department. Since then, I've had either my lawyers or friends communicate with them. I will not deal with that sort of person anymore. The obvious question comes up, why weren't the passengers warned? The first answer that came down from the administration is that there are so many threats, so many warnings that come out every year that airline travel would be paralyzed if they were all publicized. As it turned out, there were only 25 high-level warnings during 1988. The so-called Helsinki warning was one of them. Then we were told that the Helsinki warning was a hoax. A gruesome coincidence, I think, was the felicitous phrase used by an FBI spokesman. I wonder if this was a hoax. The hoaxer may have been psychic. In any event, the Helsinki warning was not withdrawn. Then, in February, it turned out that the Helsinki warning wasn't the only warning. Mr. Ammerman has already uh, talked about these. There had been specific, detailed information about a bomb in a Toshiba cassette recorder that had been taken from known terrorists in Germany in October. Most of the terrorists, the terrorists were arrested and then most of them were released. This information was in the hands of the American security forces. It was in the hands of Pan Am and the other airlines. What they did about it and what they did not do about it is obviously the subject of investigation from this committee and from other areas. Still, we were being assured that there was no two-tier warning system. And yet, Pan Am 103 flew one-third empty at the busiest travel time of the year. They tell us that's normal, but that's a figure that still gnaws at me. I'm sorry. Warnings like the Helsinki warning are routinely given to hundreds and sometimes thousands of individuals at airports, embassies, and foreign governments. These are not closely guarded intelligence secrets. I imagine myself as a clerk at the American Embassy in Washington, and the Helsinki warning passes my, over my desk, and I know my daughter is flying back to the United States from London on Pan Am. And although it's against regulations, I pick up the phone and I say, honey, switch to Swiss Air or Lufthansa. Everybody in this room would have done the same thing, with the possible exception, uh, exception of Mr. Yaffe, who testified this morning. But I'm sure that every one of you would have done the same thing, regulations or no. And I'm quite sure 
people did exactly that. Then I discovered that the State Department has an electronic bulletin board system, which provides detailed information on terrorist activities to some of the major American corporations. Some people do get warnings. I guess my daughter just wasn't important enough. I guess Bonnie O'Connor's brother just wasn't important enough. I guess Kathy Flynn's son just wasn't important enough. I guess that Paul Hudson's 16-year-old daughter just wasn't important enough. They all died on Pan Am 103. The administration's chief spokesman, Secretary of Transportation Samuel Skinner, makes all the ritual noises about providing security and how sorry he all is. But what really gets his juices flowing are when information is released to the general public. Around Easter time, a warning was leaked to the British tabloid press, a warning about a possible hijacking of an American plane over the Easter holidays. He went ballistic. I recall that he became somewhat apoplectic over information that came out of this committee. He even went so far as, if I remember, as, of, of hinting that perhaps lives were being threatened by the release of this information. I think lives could be saved by the release of information. Perhaps they already have been saved by the release of information. I realize my time is very nearly up, but I don't want to overstay my welcome. I started on a personal note, and I'm going to end on one. Theo was our only child. My wife and I in our 50s. There aren't going to be any other children. There are going to be no grandchildren. We have very little personal stake in improved airline security. The grim joke around our house is that we're the only people in the country who can fly Pan Am with a smile. What else can they do to us? But we are never going to have any peace, nor are the other family members, until we know, until we really know what happened. And we're not going to have any peace until we know that every effort to find and punish those people responsible, I mean the people who placed the bomb, I mean the people who paid for the bomb, and I also mean those people whose gross incompetence allowed that bomb to be placed. No one who boards a plane can really feel secure. No one who puts a child or other loved one on a plane should really be able to feel secure. We've been told by officials of the government and by the Air, and the Air Force that they're really doing a great job. There was nothing really wrong with security, and now they fixed even what wasn't wrong. Essentially, they are saying, trust us. We trusted them. You don't want to be where we're at now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Vincent, um, you seem to be particularly critical of the FAA's ability to to uh, stay ahead of the terrorist threat. And what do you think that accounts for the what is, what, is, what is it that you think accounts for the FAA's inertia? I'm sorry, Madam Chairman. It accounts for the FAA's what? Inertia. Oh, inertia. Well, the FAA is a large bureaucracy. And large bureaucracies have a tendency to, once they get set on a course, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, closer to you. Thanks. I had the mic off. Sorry. I say the FAA is a large bureaucracy, and most bureaucracies tend to get started on a course, and it's very difficult to move them off of that course. What's perplexing is I think it's clear, and it ought to be clear to them, what is necessary to correct the problem. And nothing short of what is essentially an Israeli security system will do the job. As I illustrated a moment ago, the sophistication of those explosive devices are such that they can be secreted in virtually anything. We do not have the technology to detect th those explosives yet to the degree that we need to. We do have some promising areas. But it has to be a people system built on the order of the Israeli system. The hardest thing it would appear for the 
Bush administration to do at this point is to make that decision to develop that system and then require its implementation. That's what's needed. Do you believe that the concepts of LL system would be appropriate for the American aviation environment? Now, I raise that question because it's been said that we have so many millions of passengers going out on a daily basis and so forth and so on, and uh, passengers get annoyed if they have to stand in line another few minutes while their baggage is being checked and so forth. What are your responses to that sort of cop-out, if you will? Well, it is indeed a cop-out. It was interesting to note that my successor as director of the Office of Civil Aviation Security in the FAA could not answer some of the questions on cost associated with such a system this morning. The problem with that goes something on the following. We can't do that because it's either too costly, we're much larger than El Al is, and on and on. That's the WCDTB syndrome, I would call. Looking for reasons why we can't do something instead of looking for the reasons why we should do those things and how we can get about doing them. The, the issue of size of El Al can be translated in another way. And that is, there ought to be an economy of scale. The system that supports the El Al system, the Israeli security system, is built to accommodate a very small airline, as people make no doubt. That means one or two operations at best each day at airports outside of Ben Gurion. If you look at the U.S. operation in the high threat areas, that's in Europe, in the Middle East, and South Asia, you will find that it's substantially larger and you have numerous operations each day. You have an economy of scale, which means you can spread the cost of such a system over a larger and a much wider base. What is missing is no one has sit down and said the requirements for such a system are these and enumerate them and then run a cost analysis on it. I will accept we can't do that because when this is done and when it's proven from a factual basis that it can't be done. And I don't think that can be proven. Mr. Uh, Ammerman said that he had asked uh, some airport officials outside the United States what they thought the lessons of Pan Am 103 was. What do you think is the lesson of Pan Am 103? Well, one of the lessons of Pan Am 103, and the most obvious and the first one, is that the airlines that do, do, do not do a good job at their security responsibilities give a bad name to those airlines who do do a good job. The other lessons on the Pan Am 103, first and foremost, is that the U.S. cannot continue to incrementally increase the security requirements and expect to be able to stop those sophisticated explosive devices. They have to take a systems approach. Take the whole universe and look at it and say, this is what we're confronted with from a threat level. Here are our options. Here are the systems that are, have worked successfully. Here are the things that we need to do that and then set up the system for the U.S. aviation, wherever that threat might be. Those are the lessons that are learned from Pan Am. But, Ms. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, we seem to have relearned those lessons several times. I recall TWA 840 on April 2nd, 1986. We lost four people, five people, four people from that incident, from one of those devices. And here we are still arguing almost a year after having lost 270 more people. It's time to sit down and do the job that needs to be done. That's the lesson. Madam Chairman, I just had one lesson that sure. was left out. 
One lesson from Pan Am Flight 103 is that the management security system, organizational system that is in place now is ineffective. That there is not enough sharing of information, that you cannot hold anyone accountable. This is the third hearing that I have been at, that I have listened to people from the governments and the airlines say it's someone else's responsibility. Or if you ask a question, it's either classified or we have to go into private session. Well, that's not my purview. And I think one major lesson, if we learn anything out of Pan Am Flight 103, there has to be a major overhaul of the organizational system of managing of security so that when there is a problem, our elected officials can ask the appropriate questions to the people that are held accountable right now because there is no accountability in security in the system that we've set up and that's what these people want because you have to walk out of here this evening very frustrated I know I am and I wish I could spend more time down here and most of us can't but you people must get very frustrated at night in getting double answers double talk and moving around organization is a big thing to look at thank you thank you Mr. Nielsen Appreciate the testimony. It's very moving. Appreciate that. Let me ask you two questions. I asked the question earlier today whether or not uh, identifying the luggage with the person who's on the plane would help. I got an answer that no, it wouldn't make any difference. Then later I got the answer, yes, it did. It's part of the plan. How do you feel about it? Well, I, I can answer that two ways. I mean, we have a lot of respect for Mr. Yefat, but we disagree extremely with his statement that he made to this committee today that warning should not be publicized. Warning should not be publicized, and I'll get right to your next one if you don't mind. Oh, okay. Warning should not be publicized if you have prudent security. If prudent security was in place, appropriate technology and proper training don't tell us. But we're hearing this man and we're hearing the government officials saying to us, we'll have the security in place anywhere from three to five years. We'll get it in place, but we're still not going to tell you. If you can't protect us, you've got to tell us. Second of all, of course, that's an excellent short-term measure that can be incorporated. It's not the answer. It's not the final answer, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. Well, frankly, when it happened to me in Amsterdam, the whole plane was happy that they did that because there's a possibility of a problem with it. It was a Mideast plane, and they wanted to do that. They didn't mind. No one minded the 20 hours we had to spend because we wanted to be sure the plane was okay. But let me ask another question. We passed a bill called Airport Security Act last week. Does that have any merit? Is that a step in the right direction, or do you You're think throwing, it's woefully inadequate? I'm sorry. You're throwing more good money after bad. It's the American mentality. Money solves everything. Use the money once you've got the management system in place. The bill that you just passed says that the government will make these machines. Airlines, you do it. The system is wrong. The idea and the concept is correct. You're wasting a lot more of our money by doing it this way. And I would strongly urge the Congress to say to the government, Let's do it if you're in charge and you're accountable. Then you can come back in a year and we'll see what it looks like. Ask you another question. You talked about user fees. How would you feel if the United States did all of the checking at all the airports, both here and abroad, with, involve our ferry, and then charge the airline for the service? The airline should not be out of the picture. The airlines financially... You have to pay for the service. The financial aspect should be there. I'll give you an interesting ask the question because you've raised quite a point in saying that airlines look at costs rather than uh, results. If the United States did it, the standards and so forth, and then charged the airline and therefore the customer for the service, then that cost would not be a factor in whether you have the service or not. Correct. And take it one step further. We have met with the Transportation Depart uh, Department in dialogue after we had complained for months that no one would speak to us. And in our discussions, they've indicated many times that they have problems with the foreign governments and trying to get them what to, do, what to do. When we went in August and met with Secretary of Transportation Cecil Parkinson and his assistant Portillo, on at least six or seven different occasions in our meeting, they said, well, that's the FAA. The, the, the FAA caused that problem. And I said, well, wait a minute. The FAA is telling me you're part of the problem. And all of a sudden, the conversation stopped. I agree and, and, and support that. We do. That would at least fix it. You want to comment, Mr. Cohen? I want to point out that. Um, before the, the bombing of Pan Am 103, t um, 
Pan Am itself charged an extra, I think it was an extra $5 on ticket for their alert security system, which didn't work. So if you're going to put an extra charge on, you better find out first. No, no, that's not work. what I said. I said, supposing the United States did all of the inspections. Oh, no, 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 uh, no, I, no, I understand in a, your in point. In a quasi-military, if you want to, and then charge the, the flyer for the service, either directly or through the airline. Uh, I really believe that you've put your finger on something. The, someone has to fix the responsibility. FAA can propose the rules, but if it asks the airline to uh, do it, the airline may not meet those rules. FAA my rules might be too lax, but even if they were correct, the airline doesn't do it, then you have a problem. So I'd say if you both purport the rules and actually enforce them, maybe you're better off. Let me ask another question. Uh, you uh, talked about the uh, lessons, the bombing, so on. I don't believe you got your answer, Mr. Cohen. What lessons did you find from the uh, 103? The less lessons of 103? Well, I hate to beat this dead horse. Yeah, but, no, but I, well, yeah, one we thing, really ought to learn from our problems. Well, we, 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 we really ought to learn from our, you know, from our, uh, you know, from our, our tragedies. But, you know, um, one of them is you don't, you don't, you simply cannot take either the airlines or the FAA at its word. That's, that's, that's number one, uh, that we have, we were, we essentially were hustled on this thing. Um, I think we, we, we have to understand, one of the lessons we, we have to learn is, is that if we cannot provide the kind of security that we should have, we should, since we happen to be a democracy, allow our citizens, are the flying public, to decide whether they want to take a chance on a plane or not. Most of them would. When these um, warnings were leaked at Easter time, there was no chaos in the, in the, um, in the uh, um, European airline system or in the American airline systems. A certain number of people canceled out, and that's just fine. You know, maybe if a certain number of people canceled their reservations, on U.S. carriers, maybe they would learn to take security more seriously because they would realize that security is also good business. They want, if, if, they, if they want to say, well, we're a little more expensive, it takes a little longer, but we're the safe airline, who would want to fly the cheaper, unsafe airline? Let me ask Mr. Vincent just one question. You said that uh, FAA does not, ability, does not have the ability to uh, stay ahead of the terrorist threat threat, and you said the reason is it's a large bureaucracy, and bureaucracies tend to stay on course, don't like to get moved off course. Was that your experience when you were a member of this bureaucracy yourself? Oh, I suppose that... A bad bureaucracy yeah. when you were there? I, I didn't, I don't think, say it quite that yeah. way. That if they so, what did you do to change it, shake it up? Okay. Uh, I didn't, I don't think I quite intended to reflect totally that, but Yes, it is a large bureaucracy, and it tends to stay on course. How long has it been a large bureaucracy? Uh, ever since it exists. Since it, since it, Wilbur Flight, Wyatt, 1958, Flight? when it took over from the CAA. But it, the FAA has a lot of good people, like any organization, and they try extremely hard. They don't make the political decisions. The staff working in security, I have an extremely high regard for. I worked with them for over four years. Now, in making the decision, however, it's principally a political one, and you have to stand up and you have to resist a tremendous amount of pressure from the Air Transport Association and all sorts of other organizations, and you get a lot of heat. No, I didn't succeed in changing it off that course. Incrementally, from December 23, 1983, when I issued the first emergency order to incrementally increase security in the international arena, two days before Christmas, I tried to sway that from its course, considering the very substantial increase in the threat level over 80, late 84, 1985. Did not succeed in doing so. And I the question and my time is gone, but let me just say that what you're saying is it can't necessarily be done within the bureaucracy, it has to be imposed from outside. Essentially, I left government because I could not. Mrs. Boxer. Uh, Mr. Ammerman and Mr. Cohn, I really want to thank you, f and also Mr. Vincent, but I want to s kind of zero in on the uh, families for a moment because I think what you're doing is very important. 
and is very helpful and is very difficult for you. And the fact that you're taking your grief and you're turning it into something positive is very important for us. And as members of this body, and you refer to the ch chairwoman's experiences, we all have experiences like this, and we are very empathetic. And um, I just again want to thank you. And I will be very happy to take your questions and insert them into the record as my questions, and then we'll be sure that they get answered. If there's no objection from the chairwoman, is there objection? The chair hears none. Okay. Yes. This part, this part is, is easy. It's living the rest of our lives. I understand That's the completely. Heart. Believe me, I'm a mother of two children, and I understand completely what you're saying. I'm glad that Mr. Nielsen kind of got to the point as to why you left the FAA. Frankly, I wish you hadn't left the FAA, because you're very clear in your thinking. I mean, Mr. Ammerman expressed frustration with some of the responses. Um, I, I, my frustration really is we, we just can't seem to get to the bottom of what to do. In other words, we can't get off center. And I think that what you have said and what we've heard today over and over again is El Al. We have the model. We know it has to be done, and yet, and yet we're told by the FAA uh, head of security that he doesn't even know what that would cost. Now, that seems to me a fairly fundamental issue. We ought to know what it would cost, what it would take. Then we can debate the dis and discuss. And I couldn't agree with you all more when you say that until we have a good system that we feel good about, uh, we should warn people because it's the only fair thing to do. If we were doing our job and we felt very comfortable and maybe there's reasons why we can't do it, then it seems to me until we have that system in place, we should know. And, and, and Mr. Vincent has a quote in here that is very harrowing if I can put my fingers on it. It has to do with a statement by those operating out of Iran essentially saying, let's target the Americans because their system is much easier to target than the Israelis. I mean, what more direction do we need <laughs> than that? It just seems to me very, very clear. And if we don't even know the cost, I think we're just, we're just losing our focus here on what we should be doing. Yes. I, don't, I haven't seen that particular statement, but if I'm not mistaken, if I remember, it was made by the man, that good moderate who is now president of Iran, Rob Sinjani. Is that right? Yeah, well, um, we're going to locate it in this testament. I've got it. It's on page 35. Quote, um, one only has to recall the Iranian prime minister's recent call for the faithful to attack U.S. citizens, French, etc. quote, because they are easy compared to attacking the Israelis. There it is. I mean, you don't really. The thing that's so refreshing about this panel, Madam Chairman, is that they're very clear. And what frustrates me when I talk to the FAA is um, there's a lot of good intention. Um, and Mr. Salazar said this administration is committed. I guess I want to ask Mr. Vincent, you talk quite a bit about the lack of political leadership to do this. And I wonder if you could expand upon it. You give us a list. Uh, on page 34, I believe it is, of the deficiencies. And your very first deficiency is, one significant deficiency is the lack of political and managerial leadership and resolve in the administration to ensure that a fully adequate and functioning U.S. civil aviation security system is developed and implemented. That's a pretty far-reaching statement. And since we're in politics here, I wonder if you could expand on it. Um, we heard the words, we, we keep hearing all the good words, but is it your opinion that there's not enough resources behind it, or where is this political will lacking and leadership lacking? And if well, it's us, tell us. If it's in this Congress, I think we have to know that. No, I think that clearly rests with the Secretary of Transportation, and, uh, and it's, it's not quite that clear, however, that what part the President plays in it. But it's simply a decision, very simply said, is that we're going to build the system to protect against another Pan Am 103. Said another way, 270 lives are worth doing this for. Turn that around, and that's what they've said by default at this point, is that we're willing to risk 270 more lives today, tomorrow, next month, and so on. That's what's frustrating. Let me ask you this. You, you have stated, and others have stated, 
that there seems to be a lack of information coming forward and and some have stated that the comments made toward our, our chair here uh, have been off the mark, that we would be threatening a security, maybe even by having this uh, hearing, which is ridiculous because we're being extremely careful not to do anything that would do s such a thing. So do you think there's a cover-up going on uh, surrounding this, uh, this whole incident? Would, would you go that far? No, as bad as it would, might seem. No, I don't think a deliberate cover-up, but and a good illustration is the, uh, my description on the representation of the five bombs. Now, the terrorists know about those bombs. The FAA and the people within the system know about those bombs. And hopefully, they have taken that to the point that the Pan Am screeners and other screeners down to the lowest level, when they have to search for those, know about those bombs and that way, but Mrs. Boxer, did you know about those? Could you have described those? Who didn't know about that? That was the people who were affected by that. Well, now I can't say that that's the FAA's problem and that they're deliberately covering that up, but somehow that information hasn't gotten out. To me, and granted I've changed views slightly, since I left the FAA on the distribution of information. Unless you inform the public, unless you get that type of information out, you won't have a public that's irate and demands a change. In, in the manner of uh, warning and, and, and allowing information out, it's, it, they say that, you know, we are, by allowing information out, you compromise certain sources. Now look at the information about the bomb in the cassette recorder. This information was obtained by the German police who had actually arrested these guys in, who had the bomb in their possession. By letting the traveling public know about this bomb, what sources would have been compromised? The German police arrested these people. The terrorists certainly knew they had been arrested. They knew that that information had, uh, was, was in the hands of the police. Who were the only people who didn't know? The people who were blown up. And I wonder sometime if, as the common theory is, this bomb was brought onto the plane by a dupe. If he had been warned, he or she had been warned, that perhaps a bomb might be in this kind of a, of a, of a device. Perhaps the person who gave him that, he, he would look twice as that radio that somebody had given him as a gift, or perhaps for, for, what, for whatever reason, whatever way he was duped into carrying that bomb on the plane. He would have looked twice at it had he known that this was a danger. And maybe with that kind of information out there, Pan Am 103 would never have happened. Ms. Mrs. Boxer, I think maybe the answer you're looking for is in a letter from Vice President then Bush to President Reagan on June 2nd, 1987, where he stated in his letter that successful terrorism can cast a doubt, a shadow of doubt, on the process of government if we do not act in a consistent and forthright way. The nine months that we have been involved when this organization was formed out of frustration because of silence from the executive state and transportation department. And we told the president on April 3rd, there is a severe shadow of doubt on the process of our government. And the only way that this can be cleared is a true investigation to find out where the process broke down and correct it. We are a proactive organization. We've said that since day one. We cannot bring our loved ones back. But what we can do is make sure they didn't die in vain. This was an attack on the American flag. This wasn't one wacko going on a plane. These people were professionals supported indirectly and directly by other countries. It is nine months now. 270 people died senselessly, most of them Americans. What has been done? What has been done? May I add one thing on information? I agree with Mr. Cohen on the specific incident he cited. But I hasten to add that there are bona fide and sufficient reasons to protect certain sensitive information, sources and methods. I cover that in my statement. If you're in a terrorist organization and I'm getting information from you and your colleagues find 
out about that, you're dead. I don't get any more information from you. No one else is going to come over to my side either on those circumstances. Likewise, if I am collecting information by intercepts of communications or any other things, and they find out about it, as one country did following the bombings of the disco in, in West Germany in 86 or whatever, they shut off that method. So there are good and sufficient reasons to protect data. But it cannot go to the extent that it would appear that it is a cover-up or you, you eliminate proper and correct oversight of the function. And this committee, subcommittee, has to have that access to that data to perform that function. And I would submit you cannot afford to allow someone to block you from getting that information. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Cox. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Let me extend to Mr. Ammerman and Mr. Cohen in particular uh, my own thanks for your being here and for the energy and commitment that you are investing in behalf of airline security for not only Americans but for people around the world. Mr. Ammerman, let me ask you to imagine for a moment that on December 21st, 1988, there had been in place a fail-safe security system and we had apprehended at least one of the people that were responsible for the Pan Am bombing and that that had led to the capture of the rest of them. What should we then do with them? With the terrorists that committed the act, you would follow the process that is in place now. Uh, you would have a hearing, uh, you'd present your evidence, and uh, if convicted, they would uh, face whatever penalty that our system sets up. But that's another lesson from Flight 103, because the problem is not the terrorists that put the bomb on the plane solely, it's the countries that financed it with intelligence, supported it. That was an attack on the American flag. My brother was on that flight. They didn't know who he was. He was coming home to see his family. The system we have set up here right now is a perfect system not to do anything. The system that we've set up, this process of criminal investigation for terrorism, is ludicrous. Since 1982, and we were talking about it at lunch, I think we figured out that we might have apprehended two with all the terrorist acts that have taken place, maybe three. The process doesn't work, and the key here is a dual approach. If you want to go the criminal approach and go after the people that committed this, these murders, fine. But there's also an, a political approach. And the political approach is we have to deal with the governments that directly and indirectly support terrorism or we will continue to lose. The terrorists are a symptom of cancer. And we all know a symptom of cancer, if you find it too late, the patient is dead. You've got to remove the tumor. And the tumor in this case are the countries that support terrorism. And we're doing nothing with the tumor. And I have to then say, a lot more patients are going to die. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because it needed saying. Earlier, I made reference to an article that appeared in the Washington Post not long ago by Tom Clancy. And the headline says, nothing's safer for terrorists than killing another American. Let me ask you to move further along this uh, hypothetical course. What would you do with the terrorist sponsoring states? It's in the testimony, <clears throat> but basically there are the, the, our government, under the leadership of President Bush, Thatcher, now Mitterrand has to get into the game. Isn't it interesting? We haven't heard anything from the French, but all of a sudden last week he has a problem now. And Cole, and we'll be hopefully seeing the Chancellor in, in uh, uh, November. We'll have some nice questions for him. They've got to, first of all, work together. Our, our own worst enemies are allies. We can't even get ourselves to work together in this common problem. But there's three arenas that we can work on. Economically, diplomatically, and militarily. Those are the three arenas that you have to deal with. And the greatest thing, and the media has been our greatest ally in our cause for the last nine months. I admit that. They've kept it on the front page. But the media all wants a story, and I know a couple of them over there with pencils and pens now. Get ready. He's going to say, nuke the world. And we have never said that. What we have said, 
is you must deal with these countries diplomatically, economically, and as all last resort, you must consider military options. It is senseless to say that you will never use military. You might as well say then put another bag on the plane. Here's where you put it. We have options available to us, and we have to consider them. President Bush, completely unsolicited to us on April 3rd, in the meeting of six of us there with him, said, if the fingers of state-sponsored terrorism are tied to Pan Am Flight 103, he will retaliate. That was stated to us, and he said, I know in your organization there's a difference of opinion on that, and there is. There are people in our organization that would never want to involve the military because they'll say it only bring more problems. There's others that would say you have to use it as a resort. The president has said that that's what he would do. Then a top security advisor on the McLaughlin show a couple months ago said sometimes it's better that the president is not officially told something because then he doesn't have to act. And is that what we're doing right now? We're not officially telling someone what's taking place? It seems the whole world knows what took place on December 21st, 1988, except for the criminal investigation and our politicians. I don't know if that answers your question, but that would be the, 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 re the area that we would want to see it go. Mr. Cohen? As a very first step, I think it would be unwise to consider paying large sums of money to that country which is under the greatest suspicion of being the godfather behind the bombing of Pan Am 103. We may, we may be able to get the hitman, I even doubt that, but the godfather back there, we should not be considering paying them large sums of money. Not For now. the record, do you want to be explicit about Yes, it? Iran. Yes. Absolutely. We, f we officially uh, chastised the State Department on July 20th when we met with them saying, how in God's name can you be offering $250,000 to next of kin on the Iranian flight when we have to go to court and prove this idiocy, willful malfeasance, to gain more than $100,000 for our next of kin? Here are American citizens, some people not even going from month to month now with money. We've got to go to litigation. It's going to take three or four years in the American system and prove willful malfeasance to get more money so the next of kin can survive financially. However, we're going to send $250,000 to this so-called moderate who held all of England hostage with the satanic verses, who makes a statement to kill five Americans for every someone getting killed, but we'll give them money because now we'll be able to talk to them. It, here again is common sense. Where has it gone? Has it disappeared? Look where it got them. Well, I yield back my time because uh, we've got uh, to move here, but I want to thank you very much for those remarks, and I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Mr. Owens. Just one uh, brief comment and question. I want to thank Mr. Vincent for making a forthright uh, statement in terms of what is needed to solve the problem uh, and just ask him for further clarification of that. Uh, do you think in view of the fact that we've had discussions of all these coming new detection devices, uh, you might want to alter your statement that we ought to move full speed ahead to imitate and duplicate the LL system, and that's the best answer to the problem? The uh, technology that has been fo put forward as the answer to the problem, and it's been given a public affairs slanting by the administration for that, and that is the thermal neutron analysis system, is not the solution to the problem. It is a good system. It has not finished development to the degree that it ought to be deployed the way the administration has decreed it to be deployed. It needs to get out there and get some operational experience. But no way is it ready for two, three, four hundred units to be produced and delivered. It will not detect those sophisticated bombs that contain less than one pound of Simtex explosives. There are other answers. It is a supplement to that, but it is not the answer. Thank you. We have a, a vote in the House of Representatives, so we're going to uh, recess for 10 minutes. Madam Chairman, before you do, is it necessary to have a motion to go in full session uh, to do that now? Uh, we're going to uh, do that tomorrow. All right. Is, is this 
Is this panel dismissed? No, we'll be back. We'll be back. We'll be back. Yeah, when you're done, I got it. And that concludes today's Government Operations Subcommittee hearing on aviation security. For more information, you may write to the House Transportation Subcommittee at B350 Rayburn Office Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. Coming up next, we will bring you two speeches from today's meeting of the United Nations General Assembly. Forty men have held the office of President of the United States, beginning with George Washington.